This is Thursday, October 8, 2015. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today Gerd Noyes. Welcome, Gerd. Thank you. Gerd is going to be talking about her experiences growing up in Norway during the German occupation from 1940 to 1945. So, Gerd, may I ask when you were born? February 4th, 1930. And where were you born? I was born in Bergen, Norway. What community do you currently live in? In Norfolk, Massachusetts. Your marital status? I'm married. Do you have children? I have a son who lives in Hong Kong. Long distance. Uh, long distance indeed. Do you have grandchildren? I have two little grandchildren, six and seven and a half. Hong Kong? <laughs> In Hong Kong, yes. Any great grandchildren? Uh, no, mm. no, the little ones are not enough. Where in Norway did you grow up? I grew up in Oslo. And what did your parents do for a living? Uh, my mother was home raising us, and my father had several jobs during the Depression. He was an artist, he was a pianist, also a CPA. It's interesting to hear about uh, other countries who experienced the Great Depression. Uh, can you tell us a little more about that? Yes, I can, because I was born in 1930, and in 1932, my father lost his job. He had a marvelous job in Bergen, as a matter of fact. He was the head of the, the department where they sold marvelous imported pianos from Germany. And he used to open the door and sit and play the piano to lure the customers in. And you know, people had sons and daughters that would take piano lessons. And who wouldn't be charmed by my father sitting there dreamily playing? And they said, oh, if my little Kari and Peter mm -hmm. could play like that, of course, they had to buy, buy a Beckstein. Then the depression in America caught up with him. Down with everything, they packed up all their possessions in 1932 and moved from Bergen to Oslo, moved in with my grandparents. And um, life, as everybody knew it, was never the same. We moved in with them, and the four of us got an upstairs room and that was it. My mother became the daughter of the house again. Um, Papa went out and got several jobs. I remember one of the jobs he obviously bartered because every Saturday a truck would come and deliver a case of groceries. As I said, he was a CPA, and I think he just bartered his, um, his bookkeeping for groceries. And in 1938, when things were looking up a little, I was eight in Bjarne, my brother was six. My mother took a job, interestingly, working for a Swedish company selling corsets. It's corsets and, and, um, and brassieres <laughs> made to order. And pretty soon she was so adept at it that she became the one who would, just like Tupperware, having home parties and telling other ladies how to sell it. So she became the, um, well, I guess, the instigator in, in her community. And pretty soon she had, a, all the way from Oslo, all the way down the east coast of Norway and all the way up to Bergen. She had the whole, she had the whole, the whole territory. Wow. So she started traveling. And eventually, that was the breakup of their marriage. She met her future husband. And in the middle of the war, my parents got divorced. Now here we are living in one house. And my, mother, my father went, then my mother moved from the marriage bed downstairs. I moved into the bed. They only got my bed. Then they said, now I can, be in the bed with my father, so he moved down, and my mother came up. 
she eventually moved out and got remarried, and I'm... Yeah. <laughs> it was horror. In the meantime... In the meantime... Here's the war, and the rationing started. We had to have rationing cards, and they were only good for about three months. Then they had to go and get new ones. My mother worked, my father worked, grandpa worked. My grandmother was very much of a homebody. So it felt to me to see to it that we got rationing cards. So I became the gopher. I was 10 years old, and I had enormous responsibilities. Um, we had to register in the local grocery store, and that's the only place to be as a family could shop. We couldn't just go from store to store. The story was that the, the food for, the, for us in the neighborhood would be delivered, but they never delivered enough. So we would have to go and wait in line early in the morning to be sure that we got our share. So I would get up early, early, early and stand in line to be sure that we as a family got food for our stamps. And what kind of food could you get through rationing? Um, in the beginning, it was flour and some sugar. Coffee ran out very soon and was never imported again. Um, then we would get fish. Meat was ran out and we almost never got meat. But we would, we'd, from time to time, we would get some whale, f whale, and um, some vegetables. Everything was rationed, absolutely everything. Um, okay, Gurdon, I'm uh, oh, sorry. Let's go back a little bit to, yeah. um, were you going uh, back like 1938, 1939, were you going to school at that time? Yes, school in Norway, grammar school was a seven year deal. You started when you were seven. I started, I was, I should have waited. I was only six and a half. But my mother said, oh, please take her. <laughs> so I started in 1936, before I was seven. And I had just about finishing fourth grade when the Germans marched in. One of the first things they did was requisition all the schools to keep the, for a place for the soldiers. They kept the horses in our gymnasiums. Some of the schools were sufficiently dirty they would release the schools back to the community for cleanup. When they were cleaned up, we got the schools back so we could go back to school. That lasted a little while and then they would take the schools again. So schooling became a very, very iffy thing for the next three years of grammar school. No, at one point, Quisling, which is of course stand-in for trader, decided that school, the teachers could should all belong to the Nazi party, whereupon they went on strike, so they went to schooling again. The teacher came to our neighborhood, like say, on my street, my girlfriend lived in number one, I lived in number eight, and my friend lived in number 32. Then up the hill were a couple of other friends of mine. So all of us would come to my house, and the teacher would come once a week and give us homework, in, in Norwegian and um, what do you call it? One and one and two, what do you? Arithmetic? Arithmetic. Mm -hmm. Come back the next week, gather our homework and give us new homework. And our parents would pay her because she was out of work. And she would do that for little groups of our class to keep us going. Eventually, Kristen gave us, okay, let them go back to work. And that was our schooling for three years. Mm -hmm. Comes the end of the seventh grade, we were supposedly graduating. The teachers felt sorry for us and sat us down with a map of Norway. We were going to have uh, geography and pointed out all the major, up and down all the coast and pointed out all the major cities of Norway and the major, major river that runs through. We graduated. <laughs> it was pathetic. But it, it used to be that the two last years of grammar school, they would teach English. That went out the door and was substituted by German. So we were supposed to learn German. We, sub, we 
People are not too fond of that. Living in Oslo, you, pro you obviously saw German soldiers. We lived in the suburb. I was okay. not, it was a suburb of oh, Oslo, suburb, suburb okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. But the German soldiers were everywhere. Mm -hmm. But surprisingly, and it surprises Harry too, at least in where I lived, there was no interaction. There were, there, to my knowledge, there were never any rape. The German soldiers did not attack us. Now, according to sources, there were upwards of 300,000 German soldiers. They were everywhere. They, one of the first things they did was they, they took, they went to the farms and took all the horses. Mm -hmm. They confiscated cars, they confiscated bicycles. They confiscated everything they, they could lay their hands on. They moved into people's houses, especially on the west end of Oslo, the nice big homes put people out on the street and took them for their, for their uh, higher-ups. Mm -hmm. As an aside to that, after the war, one day there was a knock on the door and there stood a man saying, excuse me, but I used to live here during the war. Do you mind if I show my family where I used to live? The lady sh slammed the door on him. Can you imagine him coming back after the war, wanting to show his family where he had occupied somebody's house during the war? Oh the boy. Gall. The guy who knocked on the door was a former German, oh boy. <laughs> he was a firmer, former German wow. something. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are absolutely appalled at that story. Earlier in the interview, you mentioned uh, Bitkom. I believe it's Vidcom Quisling who was Quisling. Quisling. Yeah. And he He was a cooperator. He mm -hmm. he had gone to Hitler in the, in the late thirties and said, I am here, I am willing to do anything you want. I will help you take over Norway. And when Hitler when the German occupation came, he said, Oh here I am and they shoved him aside and they had their own <laughs> but Quisling did his very best. After, after the war, they hung him. No, they, they actually, they shot him. Mm -hmm. uh, the person who, who actually took over for Norway, I believe his name was uh, Terboven? Terboven. Terboven. Yeah. Oh, you've yeah. done your homework. Yeah. And he, he was the... Oh, uh, he, he was a devil. Yeah. Can you tell, tell us a little more about him? I don't know much about Terboven other than he... he he just ruled Norway, five years, yeah. We were, we were under occupation. And the, the, the most, the worst impact on us all was that we were, we got hungry very fast. And nothing was, nothing, nothing was done. We were just wearing down. Everything wore down. You mentioned before the interview turnips. Yes. Go ahead. Well, in my grandfather's yard, we dug up absolutely everything and started growing potatoes. We had always had what you people call a kitchen garden. We had always had carrots and you know, they, they, they had the strawberries and raspberries. But from then on, potatoes was it because we, we needed food. We needed food galore. Uh, not too far from where we lived, there was a huge, huge area that became, they, they parceled it out, and every family would have their own parcel. And we grew potatoes, potatoes, potatoes. Fortunately for us, since we had two names, my grandfather's and my father's name were different, we got two parcels, and we were lucky. Then, of course, we were six people also in the house, and we would grow potatoes. Mm -hmm. Potatoes became a big deal. And this is because when the Germans occupied Norway, the economic picture just went blank. Well, people had work. We worked because, for instance, shoes. I remember my shoes. I, I grew them, so we cut out the toe, the whole toe piece, so my toes could go through it because I couldn't get new shoes. 
nothing was done. People are very inventive. The big fashion became big, heavy clog of wood finished with fish skin top. Fish skin? Fish skin. That is inventive. They're very inventive. Hopefully and, not so smelly. Um, no, they found a way to do it. Um, as I grew up, I outgrew my clothing, obviously, a 10-year-old girl. So we used to have nice lacy curtains and uh, drapes. drapes came down and became clothing. Where else would you get material? That reminds me of Scarlett O'Hara and Gone with the Wind. <laughs> Uh, material, the, the, your, your sheets got worn. We cut them down the middle, took the edges, put it in the middle, and sewed it together. My father's, um, you know, his uh, collar, the, the collar got uh -huh. worn, cut it up, turned it around, and sewed it back on. My father's um, old raincoat was gabardine. Yeah. They took it apart very, very carefully, steamed, cleaned it, turned it inside out, and sewed it together, and that became mine. We became very inventive. Guess you had to be. You have to, because nothing, don't forget, nothing was imported. Nothing came over the border after that. Mm -hmm. Nothing. So you had to do with what you had. And slowly and steadily, for instance, on the tramway, Three coaches on the tramway became two because they were done, and pretty soon two became one. Just think about it. Housing, people grow up, they get married, they move in with their parents, so two bedrooms become, you know, uh, five years. So you can imagine after the war, the immense backload that been, uh, took probably 10, 15 years to really sort it out. Mm -hmm. Now, Gerd, uh, of course, during the German occupation, King Haakon? King Haakon, yeah. Was uh, that's a, that's a wonderful story. That's a wonderful story because, um, of course, Quisling said you know, to the king, give up, but I'm here. And they said the king, king and the, the whole department said, Oh, really? And they fled. Now, you, if I had a map of Norway, you would understand. Mm -hmm. Here's Oslo, and they went straight east towards the, the Swedish border and then north. Mm -hmm. And kept going north, 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 till they get up above the polar circle, upon which it took them two months to get up there. They're chased by the, the Germans, and then they were lifted over to England by the England Navy. And we are very proud of what the the Norwegian government did. We are very grateful also to the English for lifting them up. And they took the money with them. <laughs> they took the gold with them. <laughs> very smart people. And I have wonderful stories also about what they, what they did in England because Quisling said, all Norwegian ships at sea returned to Norway. And they said, oh, really? <laughs> they did not. They went to England. And the Norwegian government set up a, something they called Nortra ship. All the ships, do you know this story? I've heard a little about it. They set up a company called Nortra ship, and all the ships that came in fell on the Nortra ship. And during the war, they rented them out to, to the English and the Americans. So they went in convoy shipping stuff to Russia, whatever, and all the money that came in went into Nortra ship. And after the war, all the ship owners in Norway were made whole. Whatever ship went down, or whatever money had been made, all went back to the, Nord to the Norwegians. I can't believe it. They were all made whole. And I think that that is, I think that the government that can do that during the war was fantastic. During the time Kim Holcomb was in exile, did you, your family, or anybody in Oslo manage to pick up news? Yes. Yes. Yes, because my cousin, 
was in the underground. And we went to birthday parties. I was close, my, I had one uncle who went to China, and one uncle who went to America, and one uncle who stayed home, and my cousin. Um, up in his room, he had a nice set of uh, uh, reindeer horns on his wall. Very nice, but he would go over with a screwdriver and fiddle with them. Bong, 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 bong. <laughs> and he would get London. And of course, we didn't understand a word of it because uh, there were, everything was in code. But he had to listen because it was a question of when would the slips come, the, the, uh, the drops. Because my grandfather had two dogs, Samoyeds, the, the, uh, the um, um, I don't know what you call them, the, uh, the like elk hound or it's, well, not elk hounds. It's uh -huh. more like the the uh, uh, what I forget what you people call them. Anyway, they they're huskies. Huskies, okay. Huskies, yeah, mm -hmm. huskies. We had the huskies. But Rolf would come. Could he borrow the huskies because you know he really needed to exercise? Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what he used them for. Mm -hmm. But I only found that out after the war. I didn't know that that's what he used them for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you had a cousin in the underground that and then you it somehow... It turned out my father was in the underground too, but I didn't uh -huh. know that either. Your father? My father was in the underground too. But I didn't know that till afterwards. And what did your father do that you found out afterwards? <laughs> he didn't tell me. He oh. didn't tell me. Mm -hmm. He didn't tell me what he did. Mm -hmm. But my father had been involved. Everything happened. In 1939, the Russians in, invaded Finland. And my father was involved with that because he had a whole white suit. Like, you know, mm -hmm. anurak in their pants. And when I grew up, and I, I, you know, I had nothing. I grew out of everything. And so I inherited his snowsuit <laughs> that he had used when he was out maneuvering and learning to maneuver because we thought that Norway would be involved maybe, going to help to Finland or something, but you know, bingo, we got involved. So Gerd, during the war years, you were getting a little schooling here and there you were in charge of the ration cards. Uh, did your family suffer from malnutrition? Not that I remember, because mm -hmm. they were insidious. My mother dealt in the black market. Mm -hmm. All, every grown-up was entitled to a bottle of liquor. I don't know why or how come. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and nobody in our family were drinkers. My grandparents were strictly non-alcoholic. So my mother would go to the countryside, to the farmers, and, and barter. The farmers had had a very tough time in their 30s. I, I'm too young to understand, and I never delved into why. But they really got their uppance during the war. Because although the Germans were strict, and they would get their, they would they'd take a lot from the farmers. The farmers still had much over more of a chance of holding back than the others did. So they had stuff with which they could barter. So my mother would go to the countryside, excuse me, mm -hmm. and barter for, for fruit and vegetables, specifically potatoes. That's another story. And um, that's how we kept afloat, bartering the liquor. <laughs> I have a couple of stories about that too. But one time she came home and the farmers badly wanted a doll. A doll. A doll. D-O-L-L, -L, doll. Now, I had had dolls when I was little, but they were not the greatest. So finally, I had gotten a doll. She was beautiful. She had hair like yours, but it was yellow and curly, and blue eyes that could sleep. And they took my doll and changed it for a sack of potatoes. And that was 
that is the most, that is the sorest memory of my, the wall, the war. My doll went for the sack of potatoes. But you know, to this day, possessions don't really mean anything to me. When that could go, when the doll could go, I don't have a very hard time dealing with possessions. But the memory of that, when she went, that was a hard time in my life. I was 11. But I have a fun story to tell you about Lekka, because my, I don't call him stepfather. He wasn't really a stepfather, my mother's second husband. Mm -hmm. He was a doll. He was a wonderful, wonderful man. And during the war, he and some comrades had decided there was something they needed or wanted to celebrate. And contrary to anything else, they opened a bottle of liquor. They, and most people didn't, I don't know who drank all this stuff because they, they bothered it. And they were having a party. So they're sitting around the table and they had opened a bottle of liquor. And they poured a drink all around and somebody put the bottle down like that. And it got shushed. And it tumbled. And the lekker flowed on the floor. And they dove down and, and slapped it up. After that, in our family, we always caught bottles. <laughs> I'm paranoid. I said, cork. I mean, every bottle in my mirror, I always corked them because of that. Because can you imagine during the war? There was only a pint or something, but I mean, they, <laughs> <laughs> they fell to the floor <laughs> because those were precious, precious drops. Terrible thing to waste. Oh yeah, they couldn't waste it. But mm -hmm. that is that is the story. Mm -hmm. Now, Gerd, uh, the war progresses, and I'm sure your cousin in the underground's been kind of keeping track of what uh, was he, happening in the war. He was very lucky. I mean, he escaped. Uh, I'm sure he had his close calls, but he escaped, he survived. Were there theaters open in Oslo? Excuse me? Were there theaters or movies? Yes, there were. Mm -hmm. they, the theaters were open, but every time any play or anything was played, because they were very, very closely monitored that nothing untoward would be playing. So Per Junt, Ibsen's plays, mm -hmm. they were fine. They, they were clean. They were OK. Um, I remember they, they had um, some comics. I, mean, I remember in my towards the end of the war when I was 15, I could go to some of those, or we would hear them on the radio. But they were so closely that that that, that nothing could slip through. Sometimes an un, underhanded thing would slip through, but you know that's something mm -hmm. that some very keen brain would pick up on. And they had concerts, but very, very, mm -hmm. very, very controlled. Very, How about, um, very few. But don't mm -hmm. forget, they had the curfew. Mm -hmm. We had seven o'clock. We had to be home. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock. We had to be home, and they had ca cards. We could only range. I forget how many kilometers from home. If you were found uh, too far away from your district, oh, you were in deep mang. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and for instance. They could apply to buy a pair of shoes. Now, they would take months and months and months to, to get the, to be allowed to buy it. And by then, the stores would be empty. So they would, just because you were allowed to buy a pair of shoes doesn't mean they had them. Mm -hmm. So that was another story. And clothing, as I said, it was mm -hmm. near impossible. Did your cousin uh, kind of give you progress of like, did he say anything, hey, Normandy's been invaded, Paris has been no, liberated? No, 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 because the newspapers were printed. Uh-huh. But the only what the Nazis let them print, so that was, uh -huh. no, no, I don't remember anything like that. Mm -hmm. We knew, and, but again, when they invaded, when the, uh, uh, no, I, mm -hmm. I, I think I was too young it was in, I was 11 mm -hmm. uh, when Pearl Harbor happened. 
I vaguely remember, but I didn't have the impact of it. I didn't understand the impact. Mm -hmm. And also, as I said, the, the papers were whitewashed. But the underground had papers. And I remember my father said to me, you have, you have to be very careful because some papers mm -hmm. are circulating and you, you must be careful not to be caught with it. And I said, what do you mean I, I have to? Because I had just papers. I said, no, yeah, this is that some people print stuff and you have to be careful. You have to be careful about that. I said, OK. Mm -hmm. I understood that. I, yeah. mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned before the interview, um, this is now coming on to late 1944, 1945. Uh, of course, in other parts of Europe, the Germans are being forced back, ah. but not in Norway. No, 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 not in Norway at all. It's another story because I graduated grammar school in 1943, and I went to high school. Now, that lasted exactly one day when they occupied my high school. Now, then it was arranged that we had to go to another county, which meant we had to take the train. Mm -hmm. So now they set about two cultures aside for us school children to ride the train up the county. So that meant that we went to school for, it was 8 to 12 in the morning, and then the next month, 12 to 4 or something in the afternoon. The trick was that they, they hung our school the coaches onto the troop transport train because we had to pass the ammo depot. And they thought that if we were attached to the troop transport train, they would not bomb us because, they, because everybody knew everything. They, they knew that the English knew that the school children were attached. Human shields, in other words. Sure. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So I, you know, they're never smarter than the average beer. <laughs> <laughs> so people ask, how come you come to America? And I said, i tell you the story. And the story really is the two coldest winters in memory were during the war, 43 and 44. 40 below was the no, 40 centigrade. And we stood on the open station waiting for the train because we could not go and set, sit in the station because we didn't know when the train would come. So we had to stand there. And we had no idea how long we would stand and when the train would come. And we were so miserable, it was so cold and so little clothing. And I said, one day I am going to America. I remember where I stood and exactly where I was. There was a place where we went to school it was called Grurud, G-R-O-R-U-D, Grurud north of Oslo. One day I'm going to America. That was in 1944. Mm -hmm. It took a long time. Then I came in 58. Mm -hmm. But I, I was going to come here. Well, let's get back to the, the latter half of the war. And there's still like 300,000 Germans right up it there. It was Festung Norweg. The rations got smaller, and they all grew, and it got worse and worse. Mm -hmm. And the day, of the, 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 the day the war ended, we had exactly one egg in our house. And we had a little bit of oatmeal left, and we had fish meal, because by then they were grinding up fish. We, there, was nothing, there was nothing like wheat. Or, we, did, we had nothing. I mean, we, we couldn't have survived. And I, I, I'm very sentimental, and I'm so grateful for everything that you Americans have done for us. And I think there is not enough gratitude, and people's memory is too short. But what you people did for sending your troops to us to, to free us from the German heel, I can never thank you enough, ever for doing it, for putting a stop to Hitler, to finally get that devil off the earth. I can never thank you enough, ever, because we were so down and out that you would never understand. Ne ever. Ever. Where I lived, there was a hill, and we lived sort of on the edge of the hill. Down was a steep escarpment, down to the bottom where there was a river, and then up again. And there was a plateau, 
and there was a German concentration camp with Russian soldiers. We knew about them. And the night before the armistice, we had heard that Denmark had fallen. That's another story. Because in Norway, when you bought a radio, you always had to register it because that was the way it was. You mm -hmm. bought it, and then you bought the ticket, and then you can hear the radio. When my father had bought a radio in the spring of 1940, he hadn't had time to register it. During the war, of course, it didn't take long for the Germans to, to get all the radios because, of course, all they needed to do was go to the registry and who has a radio. But they didn't have my father's registry, so he put it in the attic. So when Denmark fell, he grabbed his radio and put it downstairs and we had it. So we would listen to it, so we knew that Denmark had fallen. We would listen to the radio and he'd hide it again. So we knew that we were in for horror mm -hmm. and we were just shivering in our pants. And then we heard that the war might be over, that the, the Germans might capitulate but then they might not. Mm -hmm. So May 7th came, and we said, will they or won't they? And as late as now, May 7th, we heard shooting in Norway. We can hear the ricocheting, because they did not give in as late as May 7th. But then we went outside, and again, don't forget, we were up on the plateau. There was the precipice and up again in the plateau. They opened the gates in the Russian camp and the Cossacks sang and we could hear it. The night of May 7th, we could hear the Cossacks sing. We heard it up on the river, up on where I lived. And the next day, they said the war is over. But the 7th, we still did not believe it. We could hear the, the ricocheting of the, of the... That was the end of the war, mm -hmm. as I remember it. End of the war, but not exactly the end to your travails. Oh, no, 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 because we had ration cards for right up into the 50s. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I remember going to visit my aunt in England in 1954. That, they still had rationing in, in England in 1954. Mm -hmm. We had rationing several years later, but not that long. It, it eased up. We got packages from America. You know, you, you, mm -hmm. we got food uh -huh, during the war. The, the Swedish people started sending some packages to us in school. Um, we had to leave a pail so we could get soup. We got some sort of a milky soup with rice in it big clumps of rice that we banged on it was full of worms. But when you're hungry, you eat it. <laughs> and the old folks, I had to take a pail and go down to some old folks station and get soup from my grandparents. It was a soupy thing with some vegetables in it. No worms though. No worms in that. So that was the Swedes. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sending troop transport trains. Oh. I, have a, I have a hard time forgiving people. Nobody was the king. Can you imagine doing that? And he was neutral during the mm -hmm. war? <laughs> uh -huh. mm -hmm. I think I told you that some Jews tried to get to Sweden and they were turned back. Didn't, yeah, I think you missed that story. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. That's the lore. Some Jews tried to get across and return back. Swedes sent them back. Did I tell you about the, the little girl who came to, to my class mm -hmm. in 1939? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> A family moved into my neighborhood, and the little girl, Rose, came to my class. She was speaking German, and so was my teacher. <clears throat> so little Rose learned in Norwegian. And um, mysteriously, 9th of, no, of April 1930, they were gone. After the war, I learned, of course, she was Jewish. And they had a better grip on things than anybody else. They got the word, 
and they got to cross the border that night. They were lucky. They were lucky. Mm -hmm. They got to cross the border. After the war, I heard that she and her whole family got to cross to Sweden. Uh, let's get you back to immediate post-war, 1945. You're still on rations. Have you, oh, gone, yeah. have you gone back to school by that time? Yes, yes. <clears throat> because as soon as, see, now we are in May, so we finished school where mm -hmm. we were. But this, we had, we were still taking the train because, you know, the, the Germans had been in our school. School, end, school usually ends in about June 24. So there was no way that they could clean up the school for one month. So the next year I started in the school where I belonged and finished. Now high school in Norway is a baccalaureate. I don't mm -hmm. know if you know that. <clears throat> the baccalaureate in, that I took, which is high school there, if I had come here, I would start in college as a junior. We have three foreign languages, German, English, and French, and all the other math, um, science, geography, everything, written, in, written exams in all of it, <laughs> including gym. We have exams in gym. And you, if you fail gym, you have to take it again. <laughs> so. So I take it you caught up? <laughs> we caught up. Although I have never had one single class on Napoleon. <laughs> no fooling. But I have had classes in the, on the Stone Age time and again. Because when the Germans marched in 1940, they used to keep all the, all the history classes, all the books, and when it was time to have history classes, they would just deal them out in class and we would read and, you know, that was it. But they said, oh, I don't know what's going to happen here. So they gave us the books to take home, to keep. You know. So every time the, class, the school was released back to us, we would bring our school books back and we would have classes for a month or two. Then we'd read about the Stone Age. <laughs> And I don't know how many classes I had on, stone, on the Stone Age, but never on Napoleon. <laughs> I only know that he, uh, Napoleon's mistress, I think, became Queen of Sweden. Oh, and yeah, that was uh, uh, way Mary Bernadotte. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Desiree. Desiree. Desiree, yeah. Okay, so we're back in post-war. You're going through your baccalaureate. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 1948, I got my baccalaureate. <laughs> And what happened next? Then I moved to Belgium. Back because by then my grandmother was really quite ailing. And mm -hmm. grandpa, said, she, grandpa said to my mother, you've got to get your kids out of here. My mother got married in 1946. She was out of the house. In the meantime, my father and my brother and I are still in the house with grandpa and grandma. Because where she moved, there was no high school. That meant that we would have had to go to boarding school, so it was decided that we should stay where we were and go to the schools that we were used to. I should write a book and nobody would believe it. <laughs> so here my father and two kids are stuck in his in-laws house. And, and in the meantime, um, a few more words about your brother. Uh, what did he do during the war? Well, he just went to school like we did. Okay. Yeah. And what was your brother's name again? B J A R N E Bjarne. Bjarne. And what did he grow up to be? A high ranking uh, in the Norwegian Navy. And how about you? After the baccalaureate, I, took, mm -hmm. I went to Bergen. I went to the uh, Mercantile College, got my degree. And what was your degree in? Um, I don't know what you call it, you were in Mercantile. Mm -hmm. I just follow up after the baccalaureate. All, all the languages, by mm -hmm. the way, and bookkeeping, uh, all, the, uh, all that needed. I don't know what, I don't know. It's like going to Babson. Okay. <laughs> so, so it's a Babson degree. And then I worked for five years for a lawyer as an as a, um, office manager. 
<clears throat> in the meantime, Norway slowly getting back to normal. Slowly getting back to normal. Uh, the reason why it lasted five years with him was that he was the stirrer in getting, uh, had, had to do with housing. There was housing, 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 and one company after another, a lot of them were co-ops getting housing going. And in one old company, there was two, um, what do you call them, um, maids' rooms mm -hmm. up on the top floor, cold water walk-ups, two maids' rooms, and he let me live there. Mm -hmm. So I could, Bjarne, in the middle, that's another story too, when, when Bjarne and I had to move out of grandma's house, I went to bed and Bjarne was sent up to an aunt we didn't know, up in Trondheim, to finish his junior high. Then I could bring him to Bergen so he can go to get his baccalaureate. So it was really, that was a big incentive for me to stay with the lawyer because I had housing. Because the lawyer was a devil on foot. I mean, <laughs> he, he was a horror. But it made it possible for me to have Bjarne with me so he could go to baccalaureate in a decent surrounding. We were also, my mother, of course, when she married, she moved to a place outside Bergen, by down by the fjord someplace. So we had all gone to the west coast by then. So that was, he was, it, it was worth it to me to have Bjarne with me. Because Bjarne and I were like that all mm -hmm. our lives. It was, there's a hole in my heart when he died. Mm -hmm. And he was on board ship, he was a, an engine man. And he said when they would go on um, maneuvers, and they would drop death charges, you know, the whole boat would ship, so it was like snow. It, wow. it was, um, he died of, um, uh, what's the white stuff? Uh, he Asbestos. Had on on the lungs. Yeah. That was horrible. That's, that's sad. Yeah. But that's another chapter. Right. Yeah. All right, you're now in Norway in the early 50s. You're still a few years away from moving to America. What happened in the meantime? Well, I worked for him for five years I, out of it. So I, I started working in them. Um, I was determined I was going to do something or other. So I worked in, for three semesters, summer and winter and summer. I worked in hotel, uh, uh, tourist hotels in Norway to sharpen my English and French, because I really thought the hotel business would be interesting. And also, after three, I worked the summer and the winter and the summer, and then I went to France and studied for two years, and then also born. In, in France, they have a wonderful thing, and we should, we should emulate them. In France, you get the student visa for three months, you have to be in law, enrolled in school, you have to have a place to stay, and you have to have your independent money. <laughs> so my mother would go to my bank and get the bank check and send it to me in French francs. I had to have my school pass, my, my, uh, from my, the family I worked with as an au pair, and my, che my check in the school pass and my family, <laughs> and, and then I go and get my three months pass. They would not let that any floating immigrants into France. Mm -hmm. That was uh, 56 to 58. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, I had asked for, I had applied for a visa to America. I met somebody um, in one of the hotels. I met some Americans and I said, why don't you come to America? He says, I said, I'd love to go, but I, I need somebody to sponsor me. He said, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. And they did. They were from Chicago. They wrote wonderful expressions. And they said, I will sign for you. I never met them again, but that's all I needed. Somebody who would, would sign for me. And I, 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 I got the, I was in France when I got said, you can have your visa. I said, I'm not ready to go right now, but please put me in, in the drawer and I'll come back to you. And while I was in France, the Herald Tribune used to issue on very thin paper, a, a weekly paper. And there was somebody um, applying for somebody who'd come to America as an au pair. So I went and applied. The family 
was in Italy. Mm -hmm. And the woman that they had wanted to bring home as an au pair couldn't come because she was Italian and couldn't get the visa. But we Scandinavians had a huge, because back then they had, they changed it, but back then there were so many Scandinavians had come to America, so percentage-wise, we had a big block. And I fell into that block. <laughs> and so I interviewed the Madame's mother who lived in France, and she wrote back and said to her mother, to her daughter, oh, you're gonna take this girl, she's great. Because I was mature, I was 26, going on 28 years old. I had been with a family with kids. I had, so I ended up in, in Cambridge, Mass. There you go. All right, you're in America. <laughs> and uh, what was your first impression? I was overwhelmed because I came a week before Halloween. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so one of the first impressions was that he come with these. these kids when you're all, all dolled up. And the second impression was that in America, they don't know what an appear means. Here it means slavery. Oh dear. <laughs> oh yes. Here it means that uh, while the kids watch television on Saturday, you wash down the kitchen. And how long were you in this, shall we say, condition? <laughs> I was there for a roughly half a year. I had met my future husband and um, I said, oh, you know, when it comes to summer, oh yeah, they were going to go some to Newport or whatever. So Bert said, well, they can come and visit us. I don't think so. I said, oh, really? I think <laughs> we changed our plans. I think we're going to get married then instead of waiting for this. So we mm -hmm. got married in May. And we married 41 years when he died. Mm -hmm. Uh, May of what year? We were married in 49. 49? No, 59. 59, 59 there 59, we 59, go. 59. So the people said that was a hasty marriage. Said, yeah, we just change our plans. We're mm -hmm. not going to wait. And for instance, I was supposed to have Sunday off. Madame, Madam, Mrs. took off. We go with her family. And he said, well, he said, I think I take off too. And I sat there with the two kids. So Bert and I put the kids in the car and, and took them for a ride. What am I going to do? There was my day off. Oh, life is an au pair. In America. In America. Not in, not in France. Oh, mm -hmm. no, no, no. That, no, no. That, that's, so you I did didn't, not advocate being in a no, pair in America. Yeah, no more au pair, so. But the reason why I was lucky is because I came here on my own. I paid my own way. I came with enough money to go home if I wanted to. I was independent. Mm -hmm. There were pairs who come here where the family pays for their trip. They soak them. They hold back their, their passport. They hold back their visa. They hold back their money. Welcome to serfdom. Yes. This is America. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I, I'm ashamed. Mm -hmm. So, Gerd, <coughs> looking back, uh, to your time in Norway, do you what do you feel toward Germans nowadays? Are are you still? I am so ambivalent because mm -hmm. my brother tried to set me straight. Yet you have to remember that the Germans you meet now are not the ones that occupied us. I said yes, I understand that, and so I can deal with them. But as a nation, I'm very leery. I, if I see a picture of anybody with that swagged hat, I go to pieces. I cannot help it. I see it, and I'm on the floor immediately. I, I cannot get over it. Mm -hmm. And I feel very resentful of losing five years to them. But it's also mixed up with all my family the family history, and I don't know to what extent things went wrong because of them. Would it have gone wrong anyway? Mm -hmm. But you see, packing up the family when I was too, I was too young to understand that. But the depression and the divorce, which of course is all mixed up in that, and the war, 
and they're being married, and I adore my, he's not my stepfather, my mother's second husband, but I mean, I call him Pop. Mm -hmm. He was a wonderful person. And he said, oh, yeah, yeah. he said, I wish you were mine. I mean, I loved him to pieces. I loved my father, I loved them all. So my, I said time and again, I wish I could sit down with somebody and just unload. Mm -hmm. Gerd, is there anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up this interview? I'm glad, for, glad that you want to listen to me. <laughs> I don't know what I could possibly tell you that you haven't heard from others. I didn't lose anybody in my family. When it comes to listening to what people had on the continent, I was lucky. The family was intact. We had food. We were hungry. Yeah, we took the drapes off to make clothing. But what they had on the continent, I'm sure, was much, much worse. And I think of Poland. You see, and Bird was a Jew. That's interesting. And he didn't lose any family because his family had come over here in the 1800s. But when I read about the Jews and what they went through, and I torture myself because I read every book I come across. I can't stand it. I cannot stand what happened in the war years. And that people couldn't see what happened. And I see what is happening now. And I torture myself with it. And there's nothing I can do. Well, Gerd Noyes, uh, we thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Natick Veterans Oral History Project. But thank you for listening. Yes.